Hey everybody, it's Allie and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, November 11th, 2012. Victoria has been kidnapped and she's being held in a room with terrible lighting. <laughs> It is hellish for her, I'm telling you. There are no luxury linens. There is no, there's no spa treatments, no manis, no petties, no massages. And worst of all, the only food that Victoria gets to eat is coming out of a styrofoam box. Ugh! <laughs> it is hard to be Victoria right now. So... We learned that the kidnapper is a guy named Eddie G. Eddie G is a mobster who was recently released from prison. And uh, to boot, he is a bookie who Billy owes over $100,000 to from old gambling debts years and years ago when Billy had a gambling problem which his family lovingly paid off most of his gambling debts for him but this is one that's just still hanging around the guy was in jail when the rest of his debts got paid off and Billy thought meh he's in jail I don't need to pay him and the guy Eddie G intimated that Billy was behind getting him put in jail, so the guy has an axe to grind. And rather than calling Billy first and being like, Hey, bro, you owe me some money. He <laughs> kidnaps Victoria right away. He kidnaps first, asks questions later. <laughs> the guy gets out of jail on good behavior, and the first thing that he does is goes and commits a new crime. Oh, well, I, I ex, convicts are not known for their excellent decision-making. So the guy calls Billy for a ransom, and he doesn't want just $100,000. He wants $2 million, to which Billy is blown away. $2 million? Where am I supposed to get Two million dollars. Honestly, I'm thinking two million dollars. So what? Just pay it. Who cares? Can't you just let's pocket change to the Newmans and the Abbots? We're supposed to believe they're the richest people on the planet, and Billy can't come up with two million dollars. Didn't Billy spend somewhere in the vicinity of two million dollars? buying a black market baby and he did that all without blinking an eye now suddenly he can't come up with it I don't get it <laughs> but apparently he's not that liquid I guess most people even if you're rich you probably don't have two million in your bank account to just get to but still your investors should be able to liquidate it for you he could sell restless style for crying out loud Victoria is beyond rich. Victoria probably does have $2 million in her checking account, but Billy doesn't have any access to Victoria's accounts, which just goes to show me, too, that Victoria is a smart girl. When your husband is a recovering gambling addict, it's a good idea to not give him access to your accounts, but if I was Victoria... I would be on the phone trying, or I would be like, I'll pay you. I'll, I'd be offering the kidnapper money out of my account. Victoria has at least $500 million from the lawsuits, which as far as we know, she hasn't reinvested in anything, so she's still got that just out probably in general stocks and investments. And I'm pretty sure that there's more where that came from. Victoria was rich well before the lawsuit against Daddy. So... It's, I don't know why they're having such trouble coming up with the money, but Billy also has this larger issue of Victoria's family. Everybody's starting to ask questions about where she is, and Nick, of course, has to be the brute force for the family. Nick goes to Billy, confronts him, gets all, oh, grumble, grumble, where's my sister? I don't know why. Nick was so hostile with Billy right off the bat, 
but I don't know. <laughs> Billy kind of threw him off the case, said, yeah, we got in a fight. Now she's on her way to Europe to chase down, <sighs> trying to get Newman Enterprises back. And then Billy gets into Victoria's email address and she writes, he writes a fake email on her behalf to the whole family saying, I'm fine, everyone. I'm just off in Europe. Billy has access to her email account, but they don't have a joint account, like a joint checking account <laughs> that he can just write this check from. I can't believe Billy can't come up with two million bucks, and I don't seem to want to let that go. But because he can't come up with the money, he needs help from someone. And he decides that that someone is going to be Nikki. He goes to Nikki and tells her, everything, what the story is, what the trouble is. And I was very surprised that Nikki was the one he chose to confide in because Nikki is Victoria's mother. Nikki is ultra emotional. And yeah, she'd be able to come up with the cash fairly easily, I would think. And even, but even when Billy told Nikki that the guy wanted two million, she was like, two million? I mean, okay, I guess if you're super rich, Sure, $2 million is probably somewhat of a drop in the bucket, but you also don't want to part with your money. You didn't get rich giving it away. <laughs> it's probably more like, oh man, I don't want to spend $2 million bucks. This is an unplanned expense. <laughs> Nikki probably had plans for that money on the redecoration of the ranch, and now she's got to spend $2 million because of Billy's irresponsibility. And right away, as soon as Billy told her what the situation was and that the guy who was kidnapped Victoria is after him because of old gambling debts, Nikki freaked out right away on Billy. She was like, you bastard, which I think was not far enough. I would have, I would have been so mad at him. I probably would have kicked him a couple of times <laughs> just to get some frustration out because here it is yet again, Billy's irresponsibility lands his family into a world of pain. And this is not the first time I've been so over Billy for so long now. I, I mean, yeah. With the, he's constantly bumbling his way into bad situations. He is like the bad news bear. Gee, I wonder why Victor doesn't want his daughter to be married to him. He is a screw-up. He may be a lovable screw-up to some of you, but he is a screw-up. And I'm not saying that Victor is any better. This is not a judgment on Victor. It's not even about Victor. Just focusing on Billy, he is a screw-up. <laughs> and this is yet another instance of his poor decision-making yanking his wife into some crazy situation. And in fact, her life is being threatened right now. So Billy is able to refocus Nikki and say, let's just focus on Victoria. I understand that you're mad at me, but... We need to focus on the situation at hand. I need money. And more importantly, I really need you to not tell Victor about all of this. This was one of his main concerns. He made sure to drive home the point to Nikki. Don't tell Victor what's going on, which I think, I don't know. I think that telling Victor would be the easiest answer. It would be the easiest out. Surely Victor can make two million liquid right away. Victor would get up in it. He would be the controlling freak. Um, so, I mean, I guess I understand. I guess I can understand why he wouldn't want Victor involved. But in a, in a way, I, I almost get the sense that Billy also just didn't want Victor to have more ammunition to use against him. Victor had approached Billy earlier in the week to say, I'm going to tell Victoria everything about the, the, the fact that you knew I was alive in L.A. and you didn't tell her. They, they had a deal previously where Victor was going to keep this secret, but now Victor is totally back on Billy's back. The walls are closing in on Billy. Something's going to happen. As soon as Victoria finds out that this was about the gambling thing, that's going to set her over the edge. And if Victor follows up with the information about L.A., Billy's just a goner. <laughs> it is a bad situation. So I guess I can understand why he wouldn't tell Victor, but it sucks dually because now it puts Nikki in this position of having to lie to Victor when they are just trying to get their relationship back on track. A huge part of it being based on no secrets, no more lies, and now Nikki has to lie to Victor. She 
goes to their accountant, meets with him in a public place, asks him if he can make this money liquid. The banker is also like, Shh, two mil? Come on, these people are billionaires. <laughs> two million. And she says, I just need the money. Don't ask me any questions. And above all, don't tell Victor. And who walks in right behind her as soon as she's saying, don't tell Victor? Victor. And Victor says, what is it now that you're not supposed to be telling me? And Nikki skirts around, she does a little dance. Oh, oh, it was a, um, uh, I was gonna surprise you. You're so difficult to surprise. I was, uh, uh, gonna arrange a surprise for you and the accountant was gonna help me out with it. Yeah, Victor, Nikki's got a surprise for you, all right. <laughs> He's not gonna notice that two million is gone. How's she gonna come up with a surprise that's gonna equal two million dollars? I just, it's, it's deeper and deeper. Lies just get these people in deeper and deeper. But for now, Victor's thrown off the trail, even though he knows something's up with Nikki. He knows her too well for that. But Victor's off on his way for now, although I wouldn't be surprised if he did a little further digging. Nikki's trying to come up with the money, and Billy has got a backup plan. Billy has got a gun. <laughs> There's gonna be an exchange. He's gonna have to take this money to this Eddie G guy and he's gonna make sure he's packing some heat when he goes. Yeah, because bringing a gun into the situation won't make things any more dangerous. It's an already dangerous situation. Billy doesn't need to be working with a gun. I don't have any problem with guns at all. I think that if Billy was trained at using a gun, perhaps, yes, this might be able to protect him. But this is a soap opera. This is a soap opera world. And gun means danger. Gun means somebody gonna get shot. <laughs> somebody gonna get shot. <laughs> and I don't know. Uh, and knowing that Billy Miller had plans to leave the show, I don't know if that's still the case, if he's still working on a deal, but last I heard, the last casting update I heard was that Billy Miller was leaving the show, and maybe they were going to be able to work something out, but I don't know if anything ever came with, of that, so my mind is wondering if somebody's going to get shot, is it going to end up being Billy? I just don't understand where Victor's hostility toward Nick is coming from. Why is he so angry that Nick has decided to live his own life? He gave his children the choice as to whether or not they wanted to fight for his company. And then he turns around and is insanely enraged that Nick doesn't want to do it. And I don't, I don't know why. I, I don't understand Victor's motive right now. And Nick and Victor got into a bad fight this week. It was very raised voices, very heated. Victor has built this company from the, with his bare hands. And he wants his preferred son to help take it over. I, in a way, I almost think that Victoria has always kind of been second banana in this equation, and it really always has been the case. Way back since I started watching, Victor always wanted Nick to be at the helm, and Victoria was the one that showed much more capability. She was much more business savvy, but Victor always wanted it to be Nick, and you could always tell that Victor would put Nick into positions of power and let Victoria assist. It was, you know, it was very much that this company was handed to Nick and he didn't really want it. I mean, even going back to the 90s where Nick decided not to work at Newman, he decided to start a coffee house instead. It's been apparent in Nick's personality since day one that he was not the shark of a businessman that other of Victor's children are. And so I don't know why Victor just continues to harp on him. Nick made the point that how long am I supposed to be beholden to your dreams? Is it till you're dead? Is it till I'm dead? What's the what's the rules here? Do, do my kids 
have to work for Newman Enterprises too? Are they bound to slavery at this company for their entire lives too? I, 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 I can't connect with Victor on this. He, he just shows such a narrow mindedness that he always has, but yes, it would be great if your children shared your dreams, if, if they always did what you wanted them to do, if they chose the path that you would have chosen for them, but that's not usually how it works. Nick is his own person. He has a right to his own life. And has it ever occurred to Victor that maybe Nick doesn't want to end up like Victor, chained to a desk for most of his life, failed marriage, children who at many points have hated him. That's not exactly a great selling point for wanting to take over New Enterprises or to take over Bic Victor's spot. Nick has his own agenda. And Nick even said, my legacy is my kids. Your legacy is Newman Enterprises, but this is my life, and I'm so disappointed in Victor. Why does he always have to be angry with someone? Isn't that how it seems? There's always got to be someone that he's in a feud with. He is incapable of sitting back and letting things happen and being happy. He always has to have some kind of problem. And oddly, Adam is the one that's keeping the company afloat right now. I'm sure that Victoria would love to be the one doing it, but the fact of the matter is Adam is the one sitting in Victor's chair while Jack is off in the hospital, and Victor knows it, so he goes to Newman Enterprises to have a talk with Adam and to give him the old family pitch. It's essentially like, you're a Newman. Why don't you be a Newman? Come on, help us out. You know, it's very like, do us this solid and uh, I'll think that you're a good son. Maybe I'll love you a little bit more, but I'll totally turn my back on you later. You know, it, he offers Adam a chance to become a Newman but it's never going to happen. Adam is always going to be on the outside. There's no amount of heroism that's going to make Victoria or Nick or Victor or Nikki or anyone else with the last name Newman trust and accept Adam. And Adam knows that. He's not a fool. Adam doesn't agree to what Victor is proposing, so Victor huffs off and he goes to visit Jack in the hospital, which was a pretty good scene. <laughs> um, Jack was lying in bed and Victor's just peeking in the door going, you need some help there? <laughs> it was very tense. Victor's being very good at kicking people while they're down. But <clears throat> I think the main reason that Victor decided to go visit Jack was because he wanted to plant a seed of doubt in Jack's head about Adam, which also doesn't make sense. Isn't it better to have Adam at the head of the company than Jack? You might be able to have an in with Adam, but you will never have an in with Jack. And it didn't seem to work. I think that Jack, he wants to trust Adam as much as he possibly can. He wants to believe the best, but he also knows <clears throat> that Adam and Victor are always going to be rivals, too. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. But Jack did make an interesting point this week, which I do think rings true. He said, I think to Phyllis, because Phyllis found out that Victor was at Newman Enterprises, and she's like Jack's little spy at this point. She runs back to Jack and says, I don't trust Adam. Victor was there talking to him. And <laughs> Phyllis is, is Jack's right hand. I don't know why he didn't make her CEO of the company. Oh yeah, because she has no experience. But, <laughs> but Jack made a really good point to Phyllis that ultimately, at the end of the day, Adam wants approval. Probably more so than any of Victor's other children, Adam is like Victor. He has to prove himself. He wants validation 
from his father. He wants to, he wants everyone to see that he is strong, he is successful, even without his father's money. Nick and Victoria have both had the golden path laid out in front of them. Adam had to work for everything that he has, and he made a name for himself before he ever came to Genoa City, before he ever knew that he was a Newman. And so there's this part of him that wants to be told that he's good by his father, wants to be recognized uh, for the things that he has done. And now that he's sitting behind the Newman desk while Jack is away, I, I, I think that Adam is on Jack's side, but that does also place a seed of doubt in my mind, and I wonder, is Adam gonna try to pull a fast one? There have been so many little moments between Nick and Avery this week that I'm just eating up with a spoon. I like Nick and Avery. Navery! <laughs> and it's, it's fun to have something light. It's fun to have a crush. And I think it's working. They had a dinner date at Avery's place, and there were so many just little moments between them that it seemed like you know, the writers or the whatever, YNR took their time in letting us just be there with them for a little bit. Like the wine tasting. Nick brought her some wine and they talked a little bit about wine and they drank it together and it was a slow scene. I, I just enjoyed it. I like her apartment. I think it's a fun new set. I enjoy them just hanging out at her apartment. Nick was going through her records. She had some vinyl on the shelves and it was funny because he pulled out, <laughs> I wonder if anybody else knows this. He pulled a record out of the shelf, put it into the player, and <laughs> like, you know, put the needle on, and then the music that played over the scene was totally not old. I mean, vinyl implies you're gonna be listening to some classic music. He puts on the needle and it's some kind of R&B. They're always kind of playing these, uh, this R&B sort of sounds over the back of it. I'm like, that totally did not match up. <laughs> I should have played something a little more classic. But I don't care. It was fun. And I, I just, I thought it was cool. Of course, <laughs> Avery is cooking him dinner in her white blouse. Who cooks in a white blouse? <laughs> it was a tight white blouse. She's making chicken cacciatore. You're, you're gonna get sauce all over yourself and then you're gonna look like a fool. <laughs> but I like how she's clumsy, klutzy everywhere else in life, but in the kitchen she's in control, so she probably felt confident that she was not going to just slap it all over the front of herself, which is what I would do. <laughs> but, you know, they're having dinner, and I'm enjoying just listening to them talk to each other. I mean, like, really talk to each other about life and family. It's so refreshing, I think, because Ugh, Weiner has been so guilty of rushing relationships so fast. Adam and Chelsea, perfect example. Rushing relationships so fast that you don't get, you, you can't get into them. Like, not everything has to be a race into bed and marriage and and family. It's, it, I, I need a slow burn. There are a lot of other couples that are taking it fast. I like that this one is slow, but still at the same time, Nick and Avery keep running into each other everywhere. They both happen to be at the athletic club to work out, and uh, they have a moment where she's getting all upset about Phyllis. Phyllis is the only obstacle in their relationship. If it weren't for Phyllis, they probably wouldn't be taking it slow. They would probably be humping <laughs> on her couch. <laughs> but they have this kind of tender moment between each other, and they share a little kiss. And unbeknownst to them, Phyllis walks in to work out at the exact same time. She sees them kissing, and she gets so enraged. She practically mutilated a punching bag later. She was just getting all of this bad energy out. But Nick and Avery were totally unaware of it. They parted ways, and I thought it was good. I thought, I thought it felt good. But then Avery comes over to see Nick later, and they make a point of talking about the kiss. I mean, 
if it was a bad idea or a good idea, they're not, they don't even leave any time to sit on it. They, like, Avery goes to him right away to discuss it. We have to, now that we've had a kiss, we have to now analyze the kiss, which they've done many times, not just with the kiss, but, I don't know, whatever, whatever moments they're having, they have to analyze it together. It's so transparent, but they both started kind of backpedaling on the kiss right away. I thought, oh good, we're going somewhere, they're realizing that they have feelings for each other, and then, uh, it's, sorry, that was a mistake. Like, I don't, Avery's like, I shouldn't have done that, Phyllis is my sister, and Nick starts talking about how this is a bad time for him to get involved with someone. I'm like, why? <laughs> why is this a bad time for, for Nick to get involved with someone? To me, it seems like it's a perfect time to get involved. I mean, uh, no, I, I guess it's probably not true. I mean, he, he's, I don't even think he is divorced yet. I don't even think Nick and Phyllis's divorce is finalized yet. But he made a point about that he's not always been faithful to his wife or his woman. Glaring understatement! <laughs> Another way to put it would be, Nick's a cheater, because <laughs> he is, but he's good at giving lip surface, and what he said was that I, I just, I want a fresh start. I know that I've not always been faithful, and I think taking this slow is the right thing to do so that I can start to be faithful with the right woman, and he got me. I was like, okay, all right. So... Avery and Nick part ways, but she goes home to have another fantasy. I love her fantasy. She's laying on the couch, but she's fantasizing about them just kissing, just being all, all up on each other. And I thought it was cool because it's like YNR is giving it to us without giving it to us. <laughs> The fantasies are a good way to make it happen without making it happen. <laughs> so it's nice, and it's a little naughty without the repercussions, which is what they're looking for because they're both so hung up about Phyllis. But still, they're creating excuses to see each other. Every time you turn around, there's some little tiny excuse to see each other. Avery <laughs> happens to leave her gloves behind at Nick's house, and Nick has to hand deliver them. Oh, good lord, she couldn't do without these. She couldn't do without these gloves overnight. I better rush them over to her apartment right away. I don't want Avery to be gloveless in November. <laughs> so he rushes over there to give her gloves, and there's about thirty seconds of, well, you know, like a little bit of flirting, but we shouldn't, but we want to, but we shouldn't. And then Nick just scoops her up in his arms and they have a passionate kiss, which I thought maybe I saw tongue. That maybe they have, <laughs> maybe they have some kind of secret soap trick where they make it look like they're French kissing, but they're not <laughs> really. <laughs> but I thought I saw tongue. It was much more passionate this time. It wasn't just a little peck. It was a full on kiss and it was full of passion there was little sparks in the air i felt the chemistry and then avery immediately pulls herself out of the kiss and she says wait you know what about taking it slow what was all that talk about and nick's response <laughs> was you know i think that's my problem i'm always thinking too much and then he goes back in for another kiss yeah, <laughs> I'm all for the kiss. I thought the kiss was great, but I could not help myself thinking, yeah, because when I think of Nick, I think, now there's a guy who's always thinking. Avery helped talk Summer out of this whole emancipation nonsense, and what does she get in return? Phyllis accuses her of trying to live her life, trying to be her, which is an argument that they had right when Avery first came into town and started getting involved with Nick. But Phyllis asked Avery to be the cool aunt to Summer and to try to help. And then as soon as Avery does that, Phyllis gets out the claws and is ready to go to town, go to battle on her. You, 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 you can't please this woman. Phyllis cannot be pleased. But then again, 
Phyllis feels threatened right now by Avery, and she should. She should feel threatened. Everyone in Phyllis's family prefers Avery <laughs> to Phyllis at this point. They like Avery way more than they like Phyllis. I like Avery way more than I like Phyllis at this point. Avery is more of a stable figure than any other woman probably in Summer's life and in Nick's life. And Phyllis is a wild card. Phyllis would be a difficult mother to have. Phyllis is wanting to get back into Summer's good graces. She wants to be the main woman in her daughter's life. But Phyllis goes about it kind of, I think, in a weird way. Phyllis tries to ply Summer's affections by buying her makeup and nail polish. Gives her like an advanced little uh, Newman Cosmetics makeup kit, which is fun. I thought that was a fun scene. You know, I'm all for Summer and Phyllis getting their relationship back on track, but then you can juxtapose that with Avery asking Summer about her homework. Avery is kind of, is taking on this mother figure role, which I can understand would upset Phyllis. It's like my two mothers at this point, but, but I, you know, I do sort of understand Phyllis's perspective, but at the same time, Phyllis only wants the easy route. She doesn't want to have to work for it. It's the same with Summer as it is with her romantic relationships. Phyllis realizes that Avery is becoming a, a, a lover to Nick and a mother figure-ish to her daughter. She realizes that Nick and Avery it, are falling for each other. It doesn't take a, a genius to figure it out. It's more than just about sex this time. They had their sexual affair to get back at Phyllis before, but this time you can see that there's something more going on and Phyllis can't handle it. She freaks out. She doesn't get what she wants, so she freaks out. She runs out and pretty much hops on the first thing she sees, which happened to be Ronan. She's at the athletic club, punching away on a punching bag. Ronan's right behind her. She turns around, sees him, and just lunges on him. She, like, starts kissing him. She, like, she's practically grinding him right out there in public. <laughs> Which, uh, Ronan looks so greasy these days. Anybody else notice his hair is greasy? He just doesn't look good. I hate his hair. I don't like, I don't like where the character's going. I can't believe what a, a 180 my feelings have done when it comes to Ronan. A year ago, I was all about Ronan. It was all about Ronan, and now I can't stand him. I don't care if he went away. <laughs> I I don't know. I I don't deny that Phyllis and Ronan have sexual chemistry, but that's all it is. And he's just he's I don't know. I'm just not a Ronan fan right now. <sighs> but anyway, Phyllis totally throws herself at Ronan. He practically has to peel her off of him, and Ronan says to her. I don't know what's going on with you. I don't know what Nick did this time to upset you, but I don't want revenge sex with you. Yeah, I don't want revenge sex with you, but I will have sex with you when you're married. <laughs> I'll have sex with you when you're married, but revenge sex, nah, it's just against my morals. Ugh. Phyllis insists that it's not about Nick. She says it's not about Nick. Please, it's all about Nick. It's clearly all about Nick. But Ronan wants her so bad, he's willing to look past that. And he asked her to go out on a date with him. I'm going to try to be open to it if I can. But I feel like Phyllis is not going to be ready for another relationship until she's over Nick. And she's not over Nick. That, it, that is something that whether Phyllis likes it or not, it's going to take some time and probably a lot of wine, too. Jack survived the surgery, and it was actually entertaining to see Phyllis and Billy sitting together in the waiting room, just quipping back and forth. He's telling her, will you stop pacing around? I don't like the sound of your heels hitting the floor. And she's like, yeah, well, you have weird eyebrows. <laughs> I really laughed at that. It was it was classic. I 
I want to love Michelle Stafford again because she does bring a lot of personality to the show and her and Billy together it was, it was just entertaining that was pretty much all of Monday's show and I, I don't know I just really enjoyed it but I'm glad also that Jack is doing good he's grateful that he didn't die during the surgery and more grateful probably even that his legs are working so the surgery was a 100% success <laughs> He has feeling in his legs. I'm sure he'll be up and dancing around any time now. Uh, but I, I think it's kind of telling that Phyllis has been there for Jack the entire time. She's been kind of the only one that's been there the entire time. Billy showed up. But Jack doesn't want him there, so he certainly wasn't hanging around all night. Ashley, Tracy, they're off in New York. I think he said that Kyle is off in New York, too, doing some kind of internship, which is weird because he has a paying job at Newman Enterprises that Jack now owns. You would think Jack would want his son right there beside him. Ugh, I could do without Kyle about 100 times. But Phyllis is the one that's there for Jack right now, and I just have a feeling... The Phyllis and Jack are going to get back together. Don't you? I don't know. I just, it's just, I don't know. I, I keep thinking. And I always enjoyed them. I thought Phyllis and Jack made a really good couple, and it wasn't until she got all caught up in Nick that things started going wrong with them. I thought Phyllis and Jack had a good relationship. Jack never cheated on her. Jack never, ever screwed her over. Uh, she, Jack was always a good husband to her. Now, what really blew me away was how grateful Jack was to Phyllis for being there for him. He actually asked her to move in with him into the, into the guest, or what is it, the pool house, move into the pool house so that it's not as if she's staying there in a romantic way. You can just, why don't you not live in your luxurious condo anymore? Why don't you move into my little tiny pool house? <laughs> And, and help take care of him, which she agreed to, and I think it's good, because he's going to need her now that he's developing a painkiller addiction. It's every single time. Jack gets a little pain. He reaches for a pill. Ooh, ah, little pain. Reaches for a pill. Got some pain? Here's a pill. Take a pill. Pop a pill. It's, it's, it's actually kind of ridiculous to see him lying there in the hospital bed. Hospitals don't just give you bottles <laughs> of painkillers to take whenever you need them. They take and portion out the painkillers for you. <laughs> but he's developing a painkiller addiction in the hospital bed. I can foresee some scenes of Phyllis realizing that Jack is struggling with this painkiller addiction and helping him through it and maybe falling in love in the process and you know maybe Jack is what Phyllis needs to move on from Nick maybe focusing on Jack's struggle will help her move on from Nick and um, I mean I I know that Ronan and Phyllis have sexual chemistry. I don't deny that. But it doesn't seem like the writers are taking it there. It just seems like, at least with Phyllis and Jack, there is an emotional need for, for both of them. Summer's grand plan for getting revenge on Ronan is to get close to Jamie, this um, this kid that Ronan is counseling, she's trying to. She gets close to him on Face Place under a fake name, Brittany. She starts chatting with the kid, and and he opens up to her. He starts telling her his story because she's led him there. But he tells her that the reason why he had gotten arrested was because he hates his dad's girlfriend, so he broke into her house and destroyed some stuff. Basically gave a full confession. And once Summer finds this out under this fake name, she goes and posts it everywhere. She tells everybody, post it all over face plays. I don't know if they go to the same high school. I guess they must, but she tells everybody at school or something. I like basically cyberbullying this kid is what it is. And I don't understand how it's hurting Ronan. How is it doing anything but hurting this 
poor, mixed up, confused kid. And Fen is there for the entire thing. Fen actually sees that this is the wrong thing to do. Fen actually has a conscience. Michael and Lauren, I think, raised him pretty well, even though he's been getting real lippy with Michael and Lauren lately, acting like my everybody's down on Michael, but acting like Michael is a warden or something, like they treat him poorly. Michael and Lauren think oh, that since he's kind of acting out toward them, maybe it's time to crack the whip. Yeah, that always works. We've been too loose with him. Now we need to crack the whip. But they don't need to. Fen is actually a good kid. But he's also a 16-year-old boy. <laughs> and you know what they're motivated by? Like, as soon as Fen starts telling Summer that she's doing the wrong thing, Summer starts flaunting herself, puts her arms around him, and kisses him, and suddenly he's hypnotized. <laughs> All of his good judgment just gets thrown right out the window when sex comes into play. And Summer... She's just like her mother. She's just like her mother, using sex to get what she wants. And she's a lot like a lot of women on the show. <laughs> she wouldn't be the first or the last, guaranteed. But poor Fen. He has got to know. He is going to be in the friend zone forever. She is never going to. She, she's using him. It's so obvious. Just, he's her little whipping boy, her little sidekick. He's never going to be anything else. You can't help feeling bad for the guy, but she's still giving him a little bit, you know? Just, <laughs> just she likes the attention. Fen clearly has a crush on her. She knows it, and she enjoys the attention. So, Nick walked in on them <laughs> at the house this week, necking. <laughs> and I thought it was kind of funny. I liked seeing Nick's reaction to this. Cassie had never really gotten to the point where she was getting sexual with guys. Cassie was just getting to the point of liking guys and wanting to wear makeup when she died. And so Nick really never experienced that 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 uh, level of fatherhood. And now he walks in with Fen smooching on his young daughter. And I liked how Nick handled it. He said, can I assume, Fen, that you will always be a gentleman with my daughter? <laughs> I gotta remember that line from my kids when I catch my kids with some guy or whatever. <laughs> I thought that was a good line. But it's not all funny because there are some really sad parts of this storyline. Later, Ronan meets up at the coffee house with Jamie and some time has passed and Jamie is explaining to Ronan how everything that happened to him, that this Brittany person talked, you know, he told her, he poured his heart out and she betrayed him and she posted it everywhere and now all of the kids at school are making fun of him, calling him Jamie the Juvie. Aww. I feel sorry for that kid, even though he looks like he could be Summer's brother. They look a lot alike, but I feel sorry for him. It's a lot harder to like Summer now after having done this. It's just very, it's very hurtful. I don't like bullying. I don't like to see anybody getting hurt, especially not a young kid. I honestly, I kind of hope this kid finds a way to get back at Summer. <laughs> Wait, I know. He can burn down the tag house. Let's face it. Tag and grab is over. It was over before it began. <laughs> Chloe is even ready to be done with it. They're in $15 million of debt over this company, and it's not worth it. Kevin is not seeing it that way. Kevin has his blinders on. He wants to save, tag and grab at all costs. It is somehow tied to his self-worth. I don't know how, but it's as if tag and grab fails, then Kevin Fisher fails too. And I don't get that. I don't see with a successful coffee house business why tag and grab has to be the end all be all of everything, but he needs money. So he goes to Michael to borrow the money. $15 million. If an Abbott doesn't have $2 million to get his wife out of a hostage situation? 
How does Michael have $15 million? I hate, hate how Kevin only wants Michael when he needs him. This is a repeating pattern. It has been going on for years and years, and it's just getting to a boil now. Michael tries to, I think, tenderly and wisely tell Kevin no. <laughs> of course Michael's frustrated. I'm sure he had frustration in his voice, and he did, but no! $15 million for your company? You need to find another project. <laughs> Just be done with it. And Kevin has some kind of mysterious freaking way of turning the whole thing around on Michael. He says, I knew you would never help me. You never do. In fact, Kevin actually said to Michael, you enjoy seeing me fail. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what I've always thought. It's every time Kevin gets into a jam and Michael runs into the rescue, it's because Michael enjoys seeing Kevin fail. No, the only reason that Michael is constantly coming to rescue you now is because he feels bad for you about what happened as a child. He feels terrible for abandoning you to get out of a, uh, a an abusive situation to save his own life. He left his little brother behind. He's always carried guilt about that, and Kevin knows it, and he plays on it. Kevin is accusing Michael of being a terrible brother when Kevin is the worst. Kevin is a terrible, terrible brother. It is all about him. It's all about Kevin all of the time. And when, I ask you, has Michael ever, ever been able to count on Kevin? Never. He doesn't even ask because he knows it's not going to happen. I don't know. It has to. It really is just recently because while I do stand by everything I just said, it has gotten so much worse just lately within the last two or three weeks. Now all of a sudden, Kevin is a manipulator. He is a manipulator and he uses love to do it. Love and loyalty to do it, which is the worst kind of user. I hate when someone tries to play on your love for them to try to get you to do something for them. I hate it. And ironically, and it has occurred to me that Victor is doing the same thing to Adam. Victor goes to Adam and it's all about family, family, family when he needs something. It's weird. Like, are we going to find out that Kevin is actually Victor's son one of these days with the way he's acting right now? I don't know why he's acting the way he's acting right now. I, I hate him. I hate Kevin right now. I, I have not cared about Kevin, I think, since Jana was alive. I really do. I, his relationship with Chloe has just never caught fire with me. I liked him with Jana. There, I felt spark, you know, with him. I was a Kevin fan until recently, and now, honestly, YNR, I feel like it's time to send Kevin off into the sunset. Do what you got to do. Get rid of him. I, I, I would almost love to see. Kevin commits some kind of horrible crime that Michael finds out about and it's going to put Kevin in prison for a long time and they have all this evidence against him. Of course, it's another cop thing, but but I would love to see like maybe Michael have a moment where he has to choose between actually prosecuting his brother or and like letting him or like letting him go. Like I, I just imagine this final scene at the airport where Michael catches Kevin or something and then at the very last moment he decides to let him go and then Kevin gets on a plane and he shoots off into the sky off to another country never to return to Genoa City and then, like the cops come in behind Michael and Michael just realizes he he betrayed his job for his brother but he, you know like he feels bad as a district attorney but good as a brother I don't know just something I'm ready to be done with Kevin he is useless he's a useless character at this point he is a man on the edge. I don't know what it's going to be, but he's going to do something extreme. Maybe he already has. 
Glowworms burn to the ground. Yeah, yeah, no, no biggie. No, just gone. Glowworms, just gone. Quicker than it came. What the heck, you guys? Glowworm burned to the ground, and there's no real focus on it. Glowworm is just gone now. So matter of fact, it was literally just man. Glowworm's gone. you guys, there's an arsonist in Genoa City, and it's on the writing team. That, like, well, I don't know if it's like a crazy troll or something who's working behind the scenes. or No, it's probably, it's like whoever's in charge now. It's like the people in charge now are all of a sudden like, let's burn it. Burn it all! Let's get rid of everything! Everything that they loved about the show. Oh, you love that about the show? Burn it! <laughs> what is up with this? All of a sudden, it seems like, feels like, they're just, the new people are just coming in and changing everything fundamental about the show. That I'm assuming that next they're going to be like, yeah, that naughtiest theme, yeah, we got to get rid of that. You know, you know what the kids are really into these days? Rap. Let's create a, a rap opening theme song for the show. It'll be a lot. We're young, we're restless, yeah. Wiggle, 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 wow. We're young and restless, yeah, 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 yeah. Young and restless, watch it now. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> I actually liked the Glowworm set. I actually liked the Glowworm set better than the Athletic Club. It's all dark and dank. Glowworm at least was a nice, classy restaurant. Where are these people gonna go? It's like reducing the number of sets. Are we gonna... <sighs> I am exhausted with this fire situation. I, I don't want to see less sets. I want to see some more sets. <sighs> I don't know, you guys. Adam paid that guy to start a warehouse fire to throw the scent off of Sharon, but I don't think the, that guy did it. I mean, I think it was somebody else, and Sharon is locked away in Adam's cottage, so we know it wasn't her. Hey, you know who else is a former pyro? Kevin! <laughs> Suddenly, just as Kevin is needing money to save Tag and Grab, Glowworm mysteriously burns to the ground. <sighs> oh, Lord, please tell me Kevin didn't burn down Glowworm, because I have no more reason to like him now. I, please, just tell me Kevin didn't burn down Glowworm for the insurance money. Uh. <laughs> you know what? Kevin and Sharon would actually make a real good couple with their mutual love of of fire. Like, Kevin and Sharon would be Genoa City's hottest couple. Like a reason to turn in, to tune in every week. Oh man. Michael and Lauren and Jeff and Gloria and Kevin are all standing around in Michael's apartment this week while Michael is reading the insurance policy and it's revealed that Gloria will get $7.5 million from the insurance policy now that it's burned down. And Gl Gloria actually seemed okay. She was like, well, good. At least I haven't lost everything. At least I'll have some money to rebuild my dream, my restaurant. Jeff, all he cares about, he's like, oh, $7.5 million. I'm going to buy a boat. <laughs> Gosh. Jeff, what a stunning display of sensitivity. And Kevin, too, immediately starts pressing Gloria for an investment in his stupid business. Oh, Mom's restaurant burned to the ground. She's probably really hurting inside, but hey, that means she's got some extra money right now. Maybe she could be my main investor. And when she says no, he starts, again, turning it around on her, going into poor me mode, calls her selfish. None of you people that care about me won't give you, because you won't give me money. Clearly, you don't care about me. It's just another way for him to find a way to make it all about him. This woman just lost something that meant a lot to her 
and somehow it's about him and the fact that they don't love him. Kevin, he's being such a depressed little biatch right now. I wonder if he is just, like, I wonder if he's just going to go kill himself. And maybe that wouldn't be such a bad idea. Why did Adam let Chelsea find out about this from Sharon? He should have never let Chelsea go down to the cottage. He should have explained himself to his wife instead of letting her run down there and just find his ex lying in wait. It looked like a love nest sort of situation and although Adam and Sharon were both able to talk themselves out of it, oh no, we're not, there's nothing going on here, nothing going on here, Sharon still it has no business being there, in all truth. And Adam had no business making this decision for the both of them. Chelsea is his wife. They're supposed to be partners. He had no right to just move Sharon on into this cottage and decide to harbor a fugitive without discussing it with her. He put their whole family, even if it's a small family, he put them in danger. And as soon as Chelsea finds out about it, her initial reaction was like, which get out of my house, which is exactly what I would have done. I'd have been like, here's your bag, Sharon, just boop, be on your way. But Adam, being the dominant male that he is, decides to trump her decision and says, oh, no, no, Chelsea, I'm going to have to. He and didn't even ask her. He was just like, I'm going to have to disagree with you here, Chelsea. Sharon's not leaving. She's going to stay here. She needs our help, period. It was not open for discussion. And I was totally on Chelsea's side this entire time. No woman would be so understanding as to let her husband's ex-wife stay with them, especially when there was so much that was unresolved about their relationship. Chelsea is right to be concerned big time because maybe Adam and Sharon aren't sleeping together now. But what about in a month? She sort of asked him, are you still in love with her? And he's like, no, 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 no. But what about in a month? <laughs> Ultimately, she just uh, she broke down and decided to agree. I cannot believe that Chelsea decided to agree to let Sharon stay there. I would have put my foot down on that one. I would have been like, oh, no. <laughs> There's a lot, I will do anything for you, babe, but I will not do that. It is totally, totally absurd. But then again, Chelsea is struggling to hold on to her husband. <sighs> she has, if she, I, I'm sure she feels like, I better agree with him and be supportive, or it's just going to push him right into Sharon's arms, and that's exactly the case. And wouldn't you know it, the second Adam got out of the way, as soon as he left, the estate, Chelsea went right down there and confronted Sharon face to face and told her, don't you dare even think about sinking your fangs into my husband again, which is exactly what I would have done. And Sharon, she handled it pretty well. Sharon doesn't really seem to be trying to cause problems in their relationship. Sharon is insane and she's trying to focus on her recovery. I'm sure that breaking up Adam and Chelsea would just be, you know, kind of a icing on the cake, but not intentionally so. But Adam, you know, Adam's gone at work and now Chelsea and Sharon are hanging out at the estate all day separately. But I just thought, wouldn't it be funny, though, if Chelsea and Sharon became friends? <laughs> like if Sharon started going up to the main house and hanging out with her, eating Cheetos on the couch, watching soap operas, that'd be kind of funny. Or what if, you know, what if, uh, what if they became good friends and got a little threesome action going on? That would, that would appease all of the fans. I always suggest that, though. Every time, every time there's a triangle, I'm always like, here, look, I'll solve this right now. Threesome. <laughs> I gotta get a hold on that. <laughs> it would be interesting. It would at least be something different. But I, I tell you. I like Chelsea more than I did. I really do. I really do. Uh, finally. I'm sure a lot of you guys are like, finally, Allie, coming around to the Chelsea bandwagon. Because I really, I'm totally digging her wardrobe right now. She looked really good toward the end of this week. She was wearing 
like this uh, choker kind of band black necklace and this cute little sleeveless dress which it's November okay nobody's wearing sleeveless in November in Wisconsin PS but hey when you're rich I'm sure you can just afford to keep your mansion nice and warm nice and toasty warm but it was like the sleeveless dress with kind of like a slit up the front and but it was like maybe like just below her knee maybe and she had these high boots on she just looked good and it made me think I seriously wish that Chelsea would start a fashion business with Chloe and then Chelsea and Chloe both become so rich that they don't need Adam's money that would be my ideal situation because for Chelsea I'm sick of seeing her under Adam's thumb for the last couple of weeks she's so insecure and so passive right now not at all the type of woman that I would picture Adam being with he should be with a strong woman I mean even when he was with Skye she was at least his equal in that way and I don't know now now it's just Chelsea is just not even at all like an ex-con woman her character is just so frail right I mean I know she just lost the baby but she's never really given me that oomph kind of a personality and now it's just gotten worse but Chelsea and Adam have had several big fights this week but especially when Chelsea found out put two and two together that Sharon burned down Victor's house they really got into it over that and it, yet again Adam was able to talk his way out of it you know I'm just I'm just protecting Sharon, you know. She called, you know, he he pretty much confessed everything that that night he lied, you know, that night that he said he had car trouble, he was really with Sharon. She was so hurt. He lied to her. It wasn't even just that he was keeping it from her. He was straight up lying to her. And this whole extra added layer of BS that Sharon needs our help. She's she's a delicate flower convincing Chelsea to let her to let Sharon continue to stay there and if Chelsea only knew Sharon the way we know Sharon she's no delicate flower this is how she gets men this is exactly what Sharon always does she needs to be saved and there's never any shortage of men to do it they're always happy to do it come in and ride in and to her rescue and get a little something on the side <laughs> while they're at it. That's always how it goes down. Ugh. Sharon is in therapy now. She's seeing Sharon's therapist. Sharon. Sharon is making progress. <laughs> Her therapist is very robotic. But Sharon is feeling comfortable with her. She actually confessed to burning down the ranch. I mean, that's a big deal. Um, and I think that she's going to the therapist is gonna keep Sharon's secret which is a good thing because Nikki has actually kinda of been thrown off the scent of Sharon now that there's all these other mysterious fires in Genoa City it's really throwing <clears throat> Nikki off of Sharon you know having done it so it seems like that's calmed down a little bit but still Sharon's life is in shambles like you can rebuild the ranch but how do you rebuild a human being Sharon needs serious help and the doctor suggested getting Sharon on medication finally yes for the love of God get this woman on meds okay <laughs> oh it has been a intense intense week <laughs> this week I've had so much to say I wanted to talk about the fact that Jill is back but I mean, it's just there's not a whole lot going on essentially Jill's back uh, Tucker is trying to get her to get Catherine to give up this idea of getting back involved at Chancellor it is absurd that Catherine is getting going to try to take the realm of, of uh, the head uh, at Chancellor Industries Catherine she can barely talk anymore she's slurred she slurs a lot now she's like 80 <laughs> I love her I just this is not a good idea it's not a good idea for her health it's not a good idea for the company uh, she can't possibly have the time I, I mean once you get old you're just not quick anymore it's just a fact of life and she's just not quick 
anymore. Um, so I hope that Jill is able to talk her out of that. Jill is back and she is fresh and she's better than ever. You can tell that Jill is really bringing it. She is just like, all of her lines are awesome. She's got this <laughs> Jill cackle thing and I, I love her. Uh, I guess the only, the only thing I was kind of wondering is like, is there something different with Jill's teeth? <laughs> And that's a random observation, but I'm looking at her and I'm like, her teeth look different somehow. I don't know, she, maybe she got some veneer or dentures or something, but her teeth look different to me. Does her teeth look different to you? <laughs> Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about Jill's teeth or anything else that's going on on the show because there is a whole lot. I really can't wait to hear your guys' comments, so please... Feel free to use the comment box and leave me a message and I'm definitely looking forward to reading and responding. Okay, <laughs> that's going to do it for me for this week. I love you guys and I'll be back next time.